Good morning, brothers. Good morning. A few months ago, it was back in January, I got some great advice uh, that I wanted to share with you. I was talking to Mother Olga, and she said, she challenged me to surround myself with holy people. And it's been really impactful in my life. Uh, the reading uh, from chapter 2 of Wisdom today is an interaction between uh, some wicked men and a just man, sort of the reflection on their interaction with him. And both Mother Olga's point and then this reading caused me to ask myself two questions. One, why surround yourself with holy people? And then two is like a two-part question. When I'm around holy people, those people I've now surrounded myself with, how do I feel internally? And then how does this cause me to treat uh, that person? So, first question, why, why surround yourself with holy people? So raise your hand if you want to be a saint. Right? That should be all the hands in the room, right? Well, it makes sense if you want to be a saint to hang around saintly people. They'll show you the ropes, right? You are what you eat, if you will. And holiness is contagious. You know, you, so there's even some saints that you know, talk about sort of the aroma or the smell of holiness. We think of, and then like saints, I think it's no coincidence that many saints knew each other or were related or were friends. You have uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola and St. Francis Xavier were roommates in college and then went on to start the, to found the Jesuits. You have St. Monica and St. Augustine, you know, mother-son combination. And then in our own tradition, you have St. Clair was so drawn to the holiness of St. Francis. So again, that holiness is sort of, is contagious and attractive. And we know this sort of in our general everyday life, that if you want to grow in a skill or a characteristic, spend time with that person. If you want to get good at preaching, hang out with Paul Dressler. If you want to get good at music, hang out with Ross. If you want to get good at football, you know, be under Tom Brady. You know, it's like <laughs> taking these people that are, that are experts in their field, spend time with them and then you will become like them. Now, just a quick tangent would be, don't only spend time with holy people. I think that can be a temptation, too, of, of only wanting to spend time. But you notice the disciples spend three years with Jesus and then the Great Commission, right, in Matthew's Gospel. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, we're also meant to go out, right? I mean, think about it. St. Augustine was not always a saint, right? His mom, who was very saintly, reached out to him. So that's important as well. But again, why surround yourself with holy people? Because holiness is contagious. The second question that I want to focus on is, how do I feel when I'm around holy people? And how does that cause me to treat them? How do I feel when I'm around holy people and how does that cause me to treat them? So I think one, one feeling that you can maybe have is uncomfortable. You feel uncomfortable being around holy people. And that can both be for a good reason and for a bad reason. And I want to start with sort of the negative reaction, which is very much what we see in the first reading from Wisdom. We see that, these, that the wicked men are uncomfortable being around the just or the holy man. It, maybe the, that uncomfortability comes from your conscience being pricked, right? because you become aware of your sins. It says uh, in wisdom, this is the wicked men talking. To us, he, being the just man, is the censure of our thoughts. Merely to see him is a hardship for us because his life is not like that of others and his ways are different, right? So it's, this, it's sort of this defensiveness that's being, that's being welled up of, of writing them off. And now let's look at, there's, there's four other uh, phrases that they attribute to him. And there's like this build in this defensiveness as you, as you get more, as they get more and more uncomfortable in a negative way, right, by becoming defensive. First they say he is obnoxious to us. So they label him. Luke was talking yesterday about labeling. So it's almost like this labeling of writing off. He's obnoxious. Next they say, let us see whether his words are true. Right? So they're, they're instilling doubt into his authenticity. Right? So they're sort of attacking his authenticity. Then they go on to say, with revilement and torture, let us put him to the test. So now they've moved not just labeling him, not just 
testing, or not just questioning his authenticity, maybe even like bullying him or, or persecuting him, right? And as this defensiveness, this, this uh, failure to accept their own sins builds, it says, let us condemn him to a shameful death. So it's gone, it's increased from this, from this labeling all the way to let's kill him. Let's get rid of him. Now maybe some of us, we don't, we're not going to kill somebody, but maybe we kill somebody's reputation, right? That's, that's like the sin of slander. So it's, the, it's this build as we, as we continue to refuse to accept our own sins, but say the problem is in him, not in me, because I don't want to change. Right? Recognizing, recognizing his holiness, the just man's holiness, causes me that uncomfortability, and I don't want to change, so I somehow have to write them off. To say that I'm still doing, I'm still doing the right thing. So I mean, an example of this, I did this in the novitiate. So there was this brother named Brother Colin Mary, and he is an incredible man. He's one of those holy men that Mother Olga, you know, would challenge me to be friends with. And his holiness, frankly, made me feel uncomfortable. You know, so I sort of started labeling him in my mind. Oh, he's like, he's just one of these over-pious guys. He's, he was the youngest guy also in the Novish. Oh, he's young, he'll learn. You know, so I'm labeling him as young and sort of ignorant. I'm labeling him as like over-pious, as, as some extremist, right? So I, I labeled him. You know, I question his authenticity. Is he doing this really for attention? Um, frankly, I, you know, I messed with him. I teased with him. I tried, I was a little edgy around him. Um, borderline bullied him, you know, and so, so again, for me, it was this failure to recognize that Brother Colin was someone, Colin Mary was someone I needed to grow to be like, that I needed to change, because really, I was uncomfortable that he was holy, because I was really uncomfortable with my own sinfulness, so that's like the negative reaction that we could have, but my hope is that we have a positive reaction, that this reaction of being around holy people brings us to a conversion, not a defensiveness. That, let, let me read again that, that line that, they, that the wicked men were saying, and let's, let's read it with that mind of conversion. To us, he is a center of, a, of our thoughts. That's a good thing, right? Merely to see him as a hardship for us. That should be good that we recognize that as a hardship, because we know that we need to grow. Because his life is not like that of others, and different are his ways. That recognition of the difference is a good thing because it can lead us to holiness by imitating this holy person. This awareness of our sin by being around someone that's holy, noticing how our lives are different, is a good thing. That, I mean, that's what Lent's about. It's becoming aware of our conversion. Joe, you talked about uh, before Mass the, the similarities between the coronavirus and sins. That got me to thinking during Mass that this, I think that scariness of the coronavirus is because you realize that you might be an unknown carrier and might affect other people. Well, that was making me think about our sins. How many of us are unaware of our sins? Unaware that we are carriers of sin. Unaware of the destruction that sin can cause in others. It can lead them down a wrong path. And let me tell you, that lasts longer than two weeks. You know, our whole lives, you know, we have this choice of leading others to sinfulness or leading others to holiness. Right? So this awareness of our sins being around someone who's holy is a good thing because it can bring us to conversion. Like, holiness should really be attractive, right? Conversion should be an attractive thing. For those who don't know what FOMO means, it's like an acronym that the hip kids use, which means fear of missing out. Do we have a FOMO of not living a holy life? A fear of missing out on a holy life? We, we, see, we see this attractiveness to holiness in the disciples. You have Peter, Andrew, James, and John, when they're called by Jesus, they immediately get up and follow Jesus. It's this attractiveness to holiness. We see with the 5,000, in the story of the feeding of the 5,000, you have 5,000 people that are attracted to the holiness so much that they don't have enough to eat. They forget food, or they don't have enough food. Right? So there's this, this striving to conversion, the striving to be around holy people. But let's ultimately realize that who is the, holy, the holiest person of all would be Jesus Christ. Right? So spending time. Hopefully there's, we can build this attractiveness, this draw to conversion of being in prayer day in and day out. I'm glad Paul last night challenged us along with Tom 
to spend more time in chapel, to be continually coming to chapel. Because in here, that holiness of Christ becomes holiness, that, that attractiveness comes into us, right? Because you are what you eat. So the more time you're spending in prayer with the holiest one of all, the more you will become Christ-like. And therefore, hopefully, hopefully also, the more you will want to be, be around people that are Christ-like. So again, in the words of Mother Olga, I hope that, that, this, that you find this attractiveness to holiness, to being around holy people, that you don't build this defensiveness. But in the end, you will surround yourself with holy people. Amen.